biggest costs of any ransomware attack will always be the downtime. And that's done deliberately because if it wasn't, you wouldn't pay the ransom. Yeah. The ransom will always be less than the downtime cost. That's the, that's the fact. That's the pressure they want to put you under. CTIO 101. Business technology. Simplified and shared. Sponsored by Fairmont Recruitment. Hiring technology professionals across the UK and Europe. Don't forget to subscribe. In this edition, Rob explains the first step and subsequent steps of a ransomware attack. Follow the escalation step by step of how something seemingly innocent can quickly develop into an existential crisis. Cyber attacks are becoming more complex and sophisticated all the time, but they generally have a simple aim. They deploy programs that run on your computer and then demand payment to unlock files or remove malicious software. In this video, we talk about ransomware or malware that encrypts files so they cannot be accessed. This kind of attack, showcased famously in the global WannaCry attack in May 2017, has been growing in popularity alongside increased awareness of cyber attacks and the growth of online networks and services. One of the things that struck me about the topic we're going to talk about um, this evening is the timing. And actually, the timing for the event we're going to discuss, um, I mean, people will know the title of this video, so it's not really a cliffhanger. Uh, yeah. But having it having it uh, late on a Friday evening, at the end of a long week, everyone's a bit tired, heat waves on, you know, let's have a, a couple of beers over the barbecue. And Rob, I'd just like to say, no beer has passed my lips um, this evening, although there, I, I may have a beer afterwards. Uh, but, but, you know, it's a sort of a vulnerability. Rob, I can tell you, um, I'm asking a man who's just probably just got the kids to bed, yeah? It was a battle uh, tonight. Uh, yeah, and, and your much. your passion is uh, how much sleep am I going to get, and are they going to stay asleep? And there's nothing worse than putting the little ones to bed when you've actually got a deadline. It's quite unusual, isn't it, to have to put them to bed to then do a a podcast at nine we, at seven thirty on a Friday evening. It was a weird trade off tonight because it was in nursery on on Thursdays and Fridays, which means right. she comes home knackered, which sort of is a plus and a minus because it means she absolutely fights the sleep like no man's business it's all screams or whatever yeah but her body is also yeah. knackered so like she'll have the big tantrum then she'll collapse and you think you've won and then she'll get a second wind yeah. and be back up and down up down up down but um yeah i think we, we we got her down at about seven she went she went quiet so i'm hoping she'll uh should be well through like a rock now but um we'll if see. we have to if, if if there's any change you know we we can we can cater for that in the uh in the in the uh with the technology not a problem not a problem at all right. so um, guess, that's all. yeah that's all right well that's good <laughs> it's good uh a future um a future future ctio 101 presenter um <laughs> so so we're going to talk about uh ransomware um and also i think i think the structure we said we would try and structure it around the key events of a ransomware attack sort of stages that we go through yeah i, I was thinking i say yeah we sort of give the overview of what ransomware actually is and the problem and then it's, it's to say it's just walking through roughly what people have to deal with as they go through them because it's like any crime right you sort of know about it but until you've experienced it firsthand you're not yeah. going to know every sort of detail there's a few things um you know having read your notes and done a bit of research. I think I need to eat a little bit of humble pie. I think I've suffered from a bit of hubris around um, immutable uh, technology, which I think we'll get to later. Uh, and it's the classic uh, technology situation where uh, you could, it, you know, you think you've got one facet covered really well, but actually, mm -hmm. if you don't have a, a number of other key areas covered, you're you're still vulnerable. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that. I think when we start to think about uh, the you know the immutable side of things but um first of all i suppose uh, unless you've been living under a rock i mean let's go right to basics yeah a ransom i mean i'm sure everyone watching this knows what a ransom is but just in 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 essence it's it's withholding something isn't it and then asking for payment yeah it, it, it's extortion of another it used to be kidnapping in the 70s you were so you take cut out all the, cut out not... the letters in the newspaper send your notes that's the one um, and then forget the fact that you did a, you know, you, you, you left your thumbprint on the on the envelope, uh, and you send it over, uh, and uh, you you pay a ransom, and then you know if it's an honourable criminal, which is a bit of an oxymoron potentially, uh, the person gets returned completely, um, you know, unharmed, uh, and then uh, the other scenario is that they're not returned regardless. Uh, and there's lots and lots of different scenarios in between. So I just wanted to get the listeners to get the frame of mind 
um, around the kind of the folks that are acting, you know, the people that are creating this problem, the folks who are demanding ransom. It's not a formulaic group, is it? It's not a kind of a, you know, if you do this, this is what will happen. It's quite a lot of different responses that you can get in different approaches, but they're not, um, as I understand it, Rob, that they're not folks that are kind of amateurish. They're, 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 there's a lot that goes in to the beginnings of a ransomware attack, a lot of potentially social engineering and infiltration. And, uh, and the folks that do it are, by the nature of the attack, need to be quite highly organized. Is that right? Or is it a... And apologies for any up-and-coming technologists listening to this stereotype that's about to come out. But is it a you know fourteen-year-old, you know teenager? It's got a few things downloaded from the web, and they're just launching it all from their bedroom and their laptop. No, I mean don't get me wrong. Obviously, there's there's some fairly high-profile cases from the past of fourteen-year-olds taking down some pretty pretty respectable businesses, which um, I guess yes. highlights just how how scary the problem can be. But um, no, I mean, you hit it now on the head quite a, with a fair few points there. Like, if you take it down to basics, you know, the whole act of extortion and ransom, it's taking something that's valuable to someone and applying the pressure in a way that makes them pay money, which is, tends to be a, a big part of our capitalist existence, essentially. Um, so as you say, it could have been, if you think back to films and stereotype stuff, it could be a loved one or a child or that kind of thing, it creates quite emotive responses. But again, with with ransomware it's just doing that with with data and as part of that in order to have a successful attack they need to make sure they're dealing with the people whose that data matters to the most yes yes and if the if you strike them with the, the data that matters the most at a time a really high pressure time or, or difficult scenario whatever that's going to create the best response and that's how they that's how they operate so in order to do that you can't just sit and i mean don't get me wrong there's there's spray and pray attacks right there's 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 lots of pretty low risk attacks flying out that just just chancing it. But when you talk about, and I think the the phrase people use is big game hunting, when they're the really smart and engineered um, attacks, they are profiling people, they're getting access to social media, they're understanding their, their lives, their working habits, what's important to them. Um, and it's worth it because it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge business, right? It's an, it's not it's an illegitimate business but it's a very viable business model what these these gangs are doing and yeah when you take i think the market um the market for 2021 was valued at 20 billion us dollars wow and when you take into account that, there's a that's few, incredible it's a huge amount um and naturally that's just been flying up as, as, as time goes by that's you know it's, it's been yeah. a huge increase and there's a few facts we can go on to later to, and, that, that attribute uh, to that uh, and Rob, I'm, I'm putting a few things up front because I think it's really important for folks to hear some of it before we go through the kind of the sequence, because then when you hear the sequence, you kind of hear certain elements for the second time and then hopefully it really sinks in. Because I think part of what we can do here um, is educate folks who think they know what ransomware is or have read a lot, a lot about it, but they haven't actually sort of taken the walk of going through an event. And therefore there's some, when I read uh, some of the work, you know, some of the preparation you'd done for this event, one of the things that really struck me was it's so obvious in your mind that the ransom is they've taken your data and you want your data back. Yeah, that's sort of quite easy to get your head around. Um, and, uh, and, and if you had a countermeasure, which is you've got some kind of super safe backup that you restore from, it was the point that you were making, which is if that takes, if that restore takes 28 days or a month or whatever, you know, if that, if that really is going to take time, then actually your act of, res of, of rest restoration is leading to potentially, you know, 28 days of outage, which means actually you might be turning to the ransomware folks for, you know, some means of getting the data faster. And, you know, it, it's those sorts of things. I think when we go through the, you know, mm. we, we, we might go over that point again, but this is where I think people really have to um, sort of go along that rule of, you know, you think you know what might happen, but it's not until you go through an event or you, you, you go through this sort of documented uh, experience that other, pe other people have had. And there, there are some really unexpected twists and turns in the, in the, in the ransomware sp space, would you say? Or would you say, you know, th and there might be some others that we, we kind of uh, no, com come across. I think, I think you're completely right. As I say, people, people focus so much on the safety net, but they don't focus on how quickly you can bounce back with the biggest costs any ransomware attack will always be the downtime. Um, yes. That's done deliberately, because if it wasn't, you wouldn't pay the ransom. 
Yeah. The Vantam will always be less than the downtime cost. That's the, that's the fact. That's the pressure they want to put you under. Um, but likewise, as you say, as businesses become way more dependent on data and driven by data, and as you know, there's not a business on on this earth that hasn't got digital transformation somewhere in their annual report or, or on their agenda. As as they yeah. become data first organisations, the implications of this data and what it contains, where it sits, where you operate it from, it's absolutely massive. It, it, it's huge and. Unfortunately, I think there's still a bit of a tick box exercise applied yes, yeah. to this in go, right, yeah. is this safe? Like, yes, broadly, tick, tick, tick. Yeah. And the, the problem with ransomware is, as we said at the start, like it's not necessarily a not necessarily a technological attack. Like it, it, it does act within the technology space, but it's a human attack, it's an attack on your business. And yeah. it suddenly lines up all these different factors together. Yes. And they all get struck at once. And yeah. if yeah. you're not prepared for that, yeah, that's, a, absolutely. that's a very sleepless few nights for you. You know, you can you can work it out because if you've got a genuine business case around automation um, and you've pursued that in your, you know, your digital agenda or whatever, and you've just hugely transformed, say, the operational part of your business or a really key part of it. And not only that, but you've done it end to end. So you've, you've put in processing all the way through. So suddenly you've got this amazing velocity of value flowing through your business you know through automation um you know that is is there 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 is there's your vulnerability suddenly it's running you know in all those compute cycles on various different bits of kit and it's storing data and retrieving data if that then gets interrupted and that i think that's one of the things we might want to just answer a bit about the nature of ransomware why you know why is it so difficult to sort of immediately uh, defend an attack when it happens you know what, what what's the big deal what are they doing technically that's just stopping making that uh, such a terrible option but if you have all that uh, automation in place and you, you stop the business it's a bit like going into a place that's got manual process and just making sure nobody can enter the the factory you know that's it's it. it's as simple as that um and and you've got in a digital uh, operations you've got you know, potentially millions of or thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of transactions occurring every you know hour, day, whatever. There's very, very high stakes, and then there's you know a lot of businesses that have just got very important information uh, that they need retrieval for uh, that's stored. I mean, what we're doing is we're just going through the scope of of technology, business technology, aren't we? And it is yeah, and absolutely massive. Absolutely, and it, it's a really, it's a very long thought exercise you actually have to go through, and a lot of the time. You know, especially if you're thinking at sort of that, you know, that CTIO, CTO level, you're focused on those high level automation. Okay, like where's this data sitting? How's it running? What's it doing for business critical operations? But you've got to work right down the chain because it's affecting people. And if you take, for example, say like a retail store, if your point of sale goes down, now, yeah, you're, you're panicking at loss of sales, but maybe you try and flip over to a manual process. Well, your cashiers are going to have to work out VAT and taxes for that. Have they, do they know? Like, is is GCC yeah. maths a, a required skill That's to right. do that job? And they got, they got a and they probably, and let's face it, manual uh, in this in that instance is still um, using uh, Excel or or, mm. or um, you know which is on the computer. It's a bit like uh, there was a really cold winter a few years ago, and uh, we our, our mains water pipe froze. And uh, uh, my wife and I were, were in the kitchen and uh, she said, oh, what are we going to do? And I said, it'll be fine. It'll be absolutely fine. You know, let's just have a cup of tea. <laughs> and I turned the tap <laughs> and of course there was no water. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> what are we going to do? So, you know, that's this sort of levels of, you know, I mean, could any business really go fully manual? You know, I mean, talking, you know, pen, paper, especially retail i mean you can't even order stock i mean there's nothing in the supply chain there that isn't running off a computer and i mean realistically if you're a business that can go and operate fully manual do you know what you're probably pretty safe yes because they're probably just yeah, but also you. like, but you're only <laughs> safe you're only safe when all the other businesses aren't being ransomed because yeah <laughs> because you're <laughs> obviously there are certain maybe there are certain sort of businesses that are uh, lend themselves more towards that but um do you know what i mean you've got to increasingly you've got to be in the digital space to survive longer term so there is a there's a little bit of a kind of a um 
you know an inevitability about having to face something like this rob i just wanted to uh throw throw something in it's just only because what you know what you've said but you know you're talking about how it's highly engineered and they might go after a particular individual mm-hmm. um i remember that as being uh, uh there was a thing called f- there's this fishing yeah which is like general and then they called it whaling when they're going for the you know the big hits yeah but um there is i think you have multi-factor authentication in in place it's a real big one i mean that's that's one of the really good overall kind of you know measures that that anyone should try and make because w- w- where i was coming from was this ransomware attack could actually start off as a socially engineered break into someone's mm-hmm. email pretend to be them you, you know to make certain decisions that aren't about you know the classic get this check paid but more about can you give such and such access so that they can actually work themselves yeah. into positions to to launch the attack? And we're going to end up saying at the end of this, Rob, prevention's way better than cure kind of thing. Um, I think the unfortunate answer is there isn't a cure. Um, yeah, it's about, it's about utilising prevention and, I guess, impact uh, mitigation. Yes. But the MFA point is really interesting. Again, just to keep stressing the human element of this, is a real bonus of MFA obviously it's got its key requirements that you know having that second login just gives you that extra amount of security people can't just bypass systems and, and whatnot but actually just having the time to think because when when you have these phishing attacks and these whaling attacks again they they do them in ways that are either apply pressure or they catch people off guard or, or people aren't expecting and again a, a, the classic one is having a, a fake CEO reach out to a junior member of staff and be like I want to pick you for this special task and they, they get all excited or whatever but actually having that moment to think as you tap in the the number or the password or whatever you go hold on they've never spoke to me before why are they why would why are they suddenly giving me this task or, or that kind of thing you, be a real... you, you, you're right though but um but the, these guys are playing off of really strong uh, uh i suppose emotional intelligence i hate to say it but they really understand how people are going to behave because and also certain industries and sectors probably are more prone to this so you have certain sectors where the non you know the people that aren't directly facing revenue generating roles you know um maybe in the sort of support there's a sort of a, a deference inbuilt deference there shouldn't be but there is a sort of inbuilt deference mm-hmm. between different portions of the business um so if i mean obviously a ceo uh you 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 pretend to be the ceo you're, you're assuming you've got you know a lot of influence over over everyone in it, 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 you know in the business i think we already said you know friday evenings holidays times of uh I, I think they don't they also research your key business events so if they know that your business in particular has got a massive event coming up they might want to plan the attack a couple of months prior so there is you know they're creating all these different pressures for for fast payment is that is that that's what they're trying to do isn't it yeah absolutely so let's say if you're a, a furniture retailer january sales huge time for, for them or maybe like a, a travel agent or they they're going to hit you at your busiest time. Um, they're going to come in, you know, they're not going to wait for you to log on on a Monday morning, have your, have your first coffee of the day, get settled in and then say, right, game on, let's, let's, let's apply a ransom. It's going to come through at two, three in the morning, potentially no one even working. You might have a couple of analysts keep an eye on things um, or whatnot. And they're going to catch you. They're going to catch you off guard and they're going to catch you at a point where you cannot afford to lose that data. And um, this is a retail uh, quote, but um, there's that statistic, isn't there? That for retail, isn't there something like is it 11 days in December that f- that represent more than 50 percent of retail sales? Or so it, it, I'll have to fact check it, but there's a disproportionate amount of revenue for retail that occurs around Christmas because of you mm-hmm. know, uh, Christmas purchasing. So, so retail would would be absolute prime target for kind of like November, uh, you know, th- those th- th- those sorts of times because. Um, you know, Rob, you might say uh, businesses need to be on heightened awareness, you know, and they should be. And there's all sorts of things, but maybe we're going to discuss about how you do that. But you cannot, as a human being, be on uh, alert, top alert all the time. It's just impossible because by, by nature, being on alert is about a change of state. Yeah. And you just get exhausted. So I think um, I think having a really clever step back and look at your key events and uh, through the eyes of maybe these folks and think about okay if i was going to do this what is our absolute most vulnerable moment um might might be would you say that's a useful thing to you know to do uh, as a sort of scenario planning for for the technologists and the business yeah i think it's 
it's important to pay attention to you, the key points in the in the business calendar year for you. Um, it's a difficult one because you are absolutely right. You can't be on full alert all year, but it's also it's difficult to say stand down between those events as well. And this is the really difficult thing you're going to be you're going to be caught in. Um, I think what it what it comes down to, and we'll I say it, we, we'll cover it off a bit more later. But a lot of it comes down to just practice and preparation, really, more than anything. Because that sort of acknowledges the fact that you won't be on your 100% guard all the time. And you'll put the measures yeah. in, you'll put the perimeter security in, all these, these different aspects. But having prepared who needs to be involved in what capacity and go through those lines of thought about what could be impacted and where means that when, when something does strike, whether that be at your busiest time of year or quietest time of year, you've at least yeah. got an idea of where to, where to head with things. All right, then. Well, look, let's try and get folks drawn into... Um you know the scenario okay so uh, you and i are um we're working in the same organization if that if that's the scenario we'll play um and uh how do we find out in uh, rob i've i've found out about all sorts of things over the years so i'll be interested in your view of how you find out and i'll see if that chimes with um yeah you know obviously i won't go into any details but i've you know uh, been around long enough to be involved in uh, all sorts of service mm -hmm. events well, let's call them uh, and uh very interesting the big ones you can remember exactly where you were when you were told I'm you know sure when you can, when yeah. you know when you realize that something serious is happening you can normally remember exactly what you were doing uh, and uh, uh, so go on Rob what's the scenario uh, that you'd like to say in terms of us discovering it? who finds out first how does it come in does it even come into the technical team does it come into the business you know is it something we notice it's something we get informed about what what, what how would you say that the play goes yeah so, so again it's going to depend largely on what the the nature of the business is, but likely you're going to get, you know, the the um, security team or the analyst team or the ops team is going to start getting a few support tickets raised. In instance, from people not being able to access, you know, their usual spreadsheet, or maybe they can't log onto a till, or maybe a petrol pump's not working. All these different things that might be reliant on the data. An analyst is going to look into it and go, okay, this is weird. It shouldn't normally be like this. We'll go and run our, our patches, our tests, or, or whatnot. And they're going to start seeing that there's a lockdown of files, or there's missing files, or there's something not quite right in the system. And um, actually, uh, Rob, that's got yeah. um, that's not dissimilar from a from a just a good old fashioned outage. No, and that's probably what they'll be thinking. The pattern that you see there, uh, you know, um, just just as you describe it. So if you were hearing that just as some a conversation. You would be, you'd potentially be getting nervous about an outage, but you wouldn't necessarily jump straight to ransomware. Uh, uh, and also, Rob, just to be clear for everyone listening and for, for make sure I understand this, you're describing the ransomware event unfolding, but actually, mm -hmm. I suppose we'll, we'll get into this. For this to have happened, they've already they've already got inside our systems a while ago, haven't they? Because this isn't something they can just land at the door and launch. This is something that takes a bit of uh, I, I, I'm probably going to use the wrong phrase, but I'm using this literally from from reading the stories of old. But this is like a Trojan horse. It's 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 already things are in place, aren't they, for them to do this? It, as it, I yeah, understand it, you're absolutely right. And it's very rare you'll get a ransomware attack that will will penetrate the network and then strike immediately. Um, yeah. They get in there, they lay dormant, they get a feel for how your network works, your files, your operations, that kind of thing. Um, Interestingly enough, the very first ransomware attacks that actually, they actually predate the internet, they used to be sent out on floppy disks and offering free software, but they had the same mentality. They, you, you put the, the floppy disk in and it could count how many times the PC had been booted and they'd wait for a certain number and then in fact, so you wouldn't attribute it to the floppy disk you've got. So it's the same principle that there might have been a minor incident, but if this has gone under the radar undetected and they will sit there for time understand the organization understanding your operations yes. and waiting yes. for that that prime time to strike so 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 the key point rob if we can sort of make this a bit cinematic okay um and i'm assuming you've seen jaws yes yes so you know um the uh, the, the the scene where the coast guard the the, the sheriff mm -hmm. he sat on the beach and he suddenly realizes and they do this really clever camera technique where they zoom in but whilst zooming in, they move the camera back. So you get a zoom, but the spe there's a really famous scene of realization. I always imagine that's the, that's the scene on the CIO's face when the moment you know it's ransomware, I know we don't know it's ransomware yet, by the way, but the moment you know it's ransomware, because it's not just we're under attack, it's, it's they've been in 
for quite a while. Do you know what I mean? It's a very serious moment because it's not just, oh, they're at the door. You know, we're going to fight them off. It means actually they've been in. It's, always, it's, 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 it's like you found out and it's too late. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's not to 100 in a, in a second. I'm not giving up, Rob. I'm not saying it's too late with throwing the towel in, but do you know <laughs> what I mean? It's that f- sort of, you know, that gravity of the situation. Um, I don't want to be over dramatic, but I don't think you can be. Uh, obviously, you have to uh, hold it together. Uh, my, my personal experience of uh, major incidents is that you do. Everyone works really well. It's, mm-hmm. it's once the event is dealt with, that's when you kind of, you know, <laughs> need a coffee and you just really, you know, the shock kind of hits you because you're, you're, you're running off adrenaline uh, to start off with, which actually you have to be careful about because if you are in a full adrenaline fight mode, you know, there's a very important rational part of your brain that's switched off. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'd wager that they even know that, you know, in terms of working out how people are going to respond, etc. Anyway, Rob, sorry, I'm getting excited. I shouldn't be because it's a terrible thing. But the, so, so, so we're starting to notice a few users can't access, you know, it's that's sort of, that's how it's sort of starting to build. Maybe no one's called the CIO yet because we've got shifts in place. It's a, you know, we're, we're looking, we don't have most of our business online at the moment, you know, so we're not, we're not even aware of uh, how many, you know, it, it could be just a few machines because there are only a few people actually logged in, but it could be all the machines. It's just that you've, everyone's gone home or they're not in use or something like that. Yeah. That's it. You'll be, you'll be starting to see patterns, but again, if your mind jumps straight to ransomware, then you're probably quite a paranoid individual, and you, you're probably not living a great, having a great time anyway. Um, so you'll probably be looking for, as you say, more common outages or just maybe patch issue issues or updates or that kind of thing. And you're going to quickly start to build that picture as more and more people log on, or as you realise more and more files are inaccessible or, or um, you know, missing or all those kind of things. And eventually, you're going to have to make that make that call to maybe an ops manager, maybe you probably wouldn't go straight to a CISO or CTO if you weren't 100% sure yet. If you're in the, you know, yeah. choose that analyst, you're probably just going to alert someone a little bit more senior to have a, have a look. And, yeah, and I think this is a really important operational point. So um, I, I subscribe to, to the view that um, if your organization can afford it, you know, if you've got the right scale, your chief information security officer, your CISO should report independently of your of your uh, CIO. Mm -hmm. I think it's just really good to have that separation. There's a little bit of marking your own homework and it's good to have that audit. Plus the fact, you know, classically CISOs get involved in things that are a little bit more meaty than just, you know, the the cyber side of it. But then on the uh, uh, CIO, CTIO's uh, perspective, we're we're managing um, a lot of operations, including quite often cyber operations. So I've always had cyber operations reporting to me. in some organizations I've had, uh, you know, a, 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 what I describe as a very wide stack of that and others it's been quite sort of thin. But I was just saying, whilst that separation is really important, one of the risks is that that pattern that you're describing um, could be, it's being potentially observed by two groups. Um, that might sound like a good thing, you know, two sets of eyes, but it can also lead to sort of a lot of cross traffic when you've got to be really organized. Otherwise, you can have almost people not deliberately briefing against each other, but you just get this because a lot of them will come to the same points for reference in the network. And, you know, I'm just wondering if, if you have a view on the governance, or, uh, um, you know, uh, where it can be re- work really well or where it can be challenging when you're trying to detect the event. I mean, obviously we've, we've got a challenge already because we know they've already infiltrated the network and set things up. So that's, that's already happened, but I'm just saying um, whether, uh, your SOC, you know, needs to make sure it's reporting in the right way and everyone's involved and comes to the table at the same time. I think you're right. I think the reporting lines are really important. And I think you actually, you see a lot of the time, any organization, organizations that have been through this do normally split out that CISO function afterwards because they acknowledge the importance of having that, that independent view on the security side. But what it comes down to mostly is you've got security teams and operational teams and whilst they've got a shared goal in terms of protecting the business and keeping business continuity going, they're, they're working in very different ways. And there will be crossovers, but probably less and less as you get further down the chain. And you're bringing these people together to work together for the first time with kind of an aligned goal. They want to get the business back up and running, but very different methods, very different approaches, very different understandings and different personal goals and egos and all these kind of things come into it. And whilst it's yeah. lovely to say that these will all get parts of the door, the fact of the matter is, is 
it's it's people working here, so they they're going to play into it, and you get a whole range of people are going to be going to be brought in to this. Um, so when say I guess to bring it back to the incident, you know you've seen once they're they're pretty certain that these files are getting encrypted or or um, or stolen or, or breached or all these things, you're probably going to get issued with a note fairly soon, and that's going to that's going to confirm that. Right, and that's is that this is the cut out of newspaper. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Um, I mean, no, but seriously, though, Rob, how do they send you the note? How do they make it so it's not traceable? Is it just a, you know, a Google account that was set up an hour ago? You know, sort basically, of, yeah, sorry, like a burner phone, but a burner email sort of Absolutely thing. Absolutely right. Yeah, just a burner email, probably via proxy, all these different things to, to help hide the tracks. It's a very much a spin up attack, bring it down, move on mentality. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you will have an open dialogue with the ransomware gang. They will speak to you. They will probably make comments on how you're responding. They will will they to get in will, your head. And who who are they going to try be? Who are they going to try and get in the head of the CIO? Or are they going to go into the commercial side? Who do they typically try and connect to first? So um, it's a good question, and it does vary from place to place. Um, I think generally they want to go after. They do want to sort of go after that sort of. Level bit because you need someone who's got the authority to be heard within the business I, enough to I hate, make a payment. I hate, about. I hate to bring this back to movies again, Rob. Maybe it's because it's a Friday evening and I'm just sort of <laughs> thinking about the you know the movies I might watch at the weekend. But that reminds me, the scene that reminds me of is you know, when uh, okay, I'm going to use Star Trek, okay, but they're at the bridge, you know, and they say they want to speak to us, and he says, So I'm not, I'm not on. a Trekkie by any means, John. I'm it's not, gonna, it's going to go I'm straight not, over my head, but I'll, uh, I'll okay. explain it. No, no, I'll use a different analogy then. With the, the police, so they're talking, you know, they've got the killer on the phone. Mm -hmm. And they say they want to speak to you. You know, okay, put them on. You know, is that, is that, they literally, that's, that's what happens. So, so the CIO could be the, you know, the point of contact uh, of, of, of talking to the ransomware folks. So I'm, I'm immediately thinking when you get to senior positions, it's quite common to get media training. You know, mm -hmm. big companies will do that, you know, to make you media savvy, how to, you know, face questions, answer questions, make sure you do answer the questions, but also, you know, answer them in a responsible way for the company. Um, I, I would have thought it'd been pretty good to, to train and simulate speaking to, uh, you know, these folks. It's a really interesting point, actually. It's, it's... Moment in your career where you're just going to say, actually, I'm not, I've, I've never done this before. And these are proper criminals. Yeah, you're, you're, you turn CIO, CIO stroke hostage negotiator, don't you? And that's uh, yeah, probably not yeah, what you signed absolutely. up for. Well, it's interesting. And I don't think anyone knows what they signed up for, but uh, you know, because you never know what's going to happen. But that, I think that is a genuine kind of moment where you are, um, yeah. And if, you, and if the adrenaline's too in, you know, and you're mm -hmm. being a bit too feisty with them, that, that might not be the right thing to do or it might be i don't know but go on then rob so i'm i'm getting i'm actually starting to get nervous now because i'm i'm really immersing myself in the in the in the sequence but i'm i'm i'm, I'm saying that we've got maybe we're 80 percent certain there's an attack because remember there's never 100 percent certainty until there's an absolute smoking gun in the early stages of detection but once that phone call comes in and you correlate that phone conversation with what everyone's saying in the operation center then you're thinking, okay, this is this is real. That's when it sort of goes into slow motion. You can't quite believe. So, what they're going to say? Uh, what, what, what would they say to you, Rob? What, what literally? What would they say? It, it's. I mean, it's pretty simple, really. They'll say, "Hi, we've got X data of yours um, to retrieve the the keys to to decrypt it. Pay us X amount in Bitcoin to this account, uh, and they'll give you a deadline, and the clock will start ticking, and it's." It's pretty simple, really. They, they they don't really want much more, so they're straight to the point. And it's and, it's, and it is Bitcoin. Um, you know, is that is it? You know, is it, yeah, is, just, it a theory, is it Ethereum or is it generally Bitcoin because that's a bigger uh, I use, city, I suppose. I use Bitcoin, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, admit my cryptocurrency knowledge isn't isn't too extensive. But yeah, it's essentially it's crypto, and that yeah that 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 was what brought the boom of ransomware as well, because suddenly you had a really easy unregulated way of receiving payments and completely untraceable yeah and you, you still need to money. you still need to launder it and be clever about it because obviously the i guess on the other side of the fact that it's you know it's all out in the open you can actually see all these transactions publicly yeah you can't just go and cash in 10 million pounds of bitcoin without, without attracting attention but if you still go through yeah. the motion of disputing it 
you know, launching it, putting it into different currencies and moving it around and whatnot. But yeah, it, it enables people a, an easy way to pay. So, um, so you think there's a correlation potentially between Bitcoin, which is the kind of the means of, of collecting the, the criminal collecting the value. Uh, obviously, there's got to be a correlation with some of the tooling that they're using, the encryption tooling and the way that they break into those sort of that becomes weaponized. But then combine that with blockchain, you've got these two technologies that have converged. And then you've got businesses that have got genuine dependency on their data. The third factor, that's what's created the this $20 billion a year market. Uh, absolutely. So it, 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 it's existed for Incredible. years, but yeah. the, the route to payments made it very risky and, and tricky. Yeah. You know, cryptocurrency comes along in 2010. And I think the, the, the problem they, they had with that was that the ransomware gangs were like, great, this is a great way to receive payments, but no one had heard of cryptocurrency, right? So you're going to your, your standard CIO, CEO and saying, you know, give me X amount of Bitcoin. And they're like, I don't know what that is. I don't know how to make the payment. I don't know how to buy this. Yeah. So what is that? They're saying like, is that, are those those chocolate coins covered you in Yeah, you'd have absolutely no well, idea, would you? What, what on earth is Bitcoin? But um, yeah, but I'm just wondering, even the act of being prepared to pay, and by the way, I'm not saying we should pay yet because we'll, we'll get to all of that, but just the act of being, if you decided, look, we're going to be ready for this, mm -hmm. and you set up a Bitcoin account, and you might have mentioned it, or maybe they've exfiltrated your email so they actually see, you know, some, they know it's happened. They might go, great, that's a marker. That means we can actually, you know, they're ready for us to go. For, do you see what I mean? They could be, you could be giving off markers um, to show that you're actually in a position to pay in Bitcoin because, you know, if you've got two attacks and one folks have got Bitcoin, they're ready to do it, and the other just, you know, don't know where to start, you might go, well, out of the two, let's go for the one that's ready to pay. Absolutely. I'm not saying, you know, that, that 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 could be a factor. If they're really sophisticated, that's the sort of thing they're going to be thinking, isn't it? Yeah, they, they, want, they want to make sure you've got the means to, to make the payments and, and whatnot. And it's yeah. interesting you say that because there is genuinely a strategy that, that some businesses employ where they put aside X amount a month into a Bitcoin account yeah. ready for if they get hit by ransomware. And that's their... That's their ransomware, their ransomware accrual, incredible. Yeah, it's, it's just. Like, I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? it? But but again, you know, the savvy criminal will wait until year end. <laughs> you yeah. know, wait till that's got as much in its. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to give any tips, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> you know, these are thought experiments. But um, so one of the one of the real big headaches, Rob, for a CIO, uh, it's not, it is a headache, but it's, it's so important that you don't do lip service. Is the cyber insurance every year? You know, um, it's you know, premiums are going up. I, I you know, I presume for everyone because the you know, it's becoming really. It's almost like a badge of honour if you're able to achieve uh, insurance. You know, because it and, and quite rightly so. Um, that uh, the folks that insure they want to see MFA in place. There's certain things now which are were kind of you just sort of discussed it maybe three or four years ago, and now it's absolutely. If you haven't got it, we're not interested. But in the old uh, no claims bonus space, yeah. Mm -hmm. What if you are fortunate enough to have a cyber insurance that would pay off your, um, you know, cover your ransom payment in the for the first instance? It, it that's a bit of a one-off, isn't it? Because unless you do something very drastic, you may never get insurance again. Or I would have thought the premium would go up. I mean, I don't know whether once you've been attacked, does that make yourself vulnerable to other attacks? Are they or are they extremely honourable and say no? You know. We'll, 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 we'll take them, we've ticked them, that they're okay, we're never coming back to them. I mean, you know, what what happens? Am, um, am I, have I now got a big target painted on my back? Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess there's, there's two lines to, to go down there. So let, let's focus first on paying the ransom and the, you know, the implications that gives, and then we can talk a bit about the yeah. cyber insurance and the results cool. on that. So yeah, cool. a lot of people pay the ransom. A lot of people pay the ransom. And this is why it's funny. Any statistics yeah. you read are always completely skewed because there's so many businesses who just paid, stayed quiet, and it yes. never gets reported or, or acknowledged. Um, and, and, and maybe also of the businesses who have paid, they may say they don't in the sense that you don't cool. negotiate with terrorists yeah. and you never, you don't, you know, it's not, it's not good to put out. A You're not putting that in yeah, cancellations, are you? You'd... Yeah, we, we, we pay. Uh, everyone, we pay and we've got a Bitcoin account. We're actually accruing this month. You know, <laughs> we're waiting for the next attack. You know, you, this, you, you'd never do it. But, no. the, but what you're saying is the reality is a lot of businesses are poised to try and get a, a rapid resolution and that may include paying. A lot, a lot of businesses pay. And when you, when you pay, you have to 
it's, it's not to shout it down because it's very easy to, to, as you say, give the line, don't negotiate the terrorists, don't pay it. But as we said, this is a really difficult scenario. You've potentially got, you know, it can cripple a business, it can put people out of jobs. You've yeah. got a lot of people lining up. It's an existential event. You could yeah. be looking at everyone losing their jobs, share price is gone, years of investment wiped off. You know, this is this is as serious as it gets mm-hmm. for a business. So paying a ransom isn't something where folks are getting into the morality of it. It, it is existential. There is a, you know, uh, and and businesses have to act in the best interests of all the shareholders, and, you know, the business itself. And that's and that's just purely businesses. Think about think about national infrastructure yeah. and public sector organizations, yeah. these things and you know, colonial pipeline is a huge headline. Um recently, you know, a big oil and gas supplier. Like yeah. they they supplied too much to, to have the downtime and they, they, they made the payment. Like it's the, the I say the implications are huge. So it's not to it's not to damn anyone for, for paying it. It's an understandable why people do, but when you do yeah. make that payment, as you rightly say, you basically hold a flag and say, we're willing to pay, which makes you a, yeah. a bit of a soft target, quick target. Yeah, and, and like you want. say, we're, and we'll just be really clear with folks who are, who are watching this or listening to this, we're not criticizing folks that do that. We're not making a judgment. We're just saying that's what happens. And you, mm-hmm. when you combine that with all the other factors we've described, you can see why, I mean, you know, my, my view would be that ransomware attacks must be on a massive uptick uh would be my my um my guess i haven't actually seen i haven't looked at any statistics rob so i don't know whether it's peaked so you, whether it's going up whether it's on the level it's falling i don't know no it is it is, it is growing interestingly it, it did dip a little bit during the pandemic they had a bit of an amnesty and then realized i think it was going to go on for longer than they thought so cracked up again like like most businesses again. Uh, no that was the um the ransomware folks had to work out their their work anywhere <laughs> strategy That's and then yeah, you know because they hybrid work they, in and They've been doing it all manually in the office and then they had to work out how to get teams up and running. Uh, but um, crikey, that's that's really interesting. So so statistically, like you say, they are skewed because there's uh, you, you're saying a lot goes unreported. It doesn't. It's not the sort of thing you offer up uh, lightly. So some of it is uh, projected, but it, it looks like it is on the increase. Yeah, and, and of the ones that reported, the people who pay, so the statistic is that you're 60% more likely to be hit again if you make the payment. But again, that's skewed by only the ones who have acknowledged they've made the payment and been hit again, so it's probably higher. And then you unlock, you unlock double jeopardy, you unlock triple jeopardy, because you might make the payment, and the ransomware gang goes, great, thanks for the payment, here's your data. A lot of them do give you the data back because otherwise their business model doesn't work. They'll give you the data back, but then they'll say, by the way, if you pay us another half a million or another 250,000 or whatever it's gonna be, we promise we won't do it again. And you go, okay, fine, I'll pay you that much. And they go, great, thank you for that. Right, we promise we won't do it again. By the way, if you pay us an extra half a million, million, whatever, we promise we won't tell anyone else how to do it. Or we won't sell your blueprints on, we won't do this. And you're sort of stuck and, where, you know, the cycle never really and Could they then come back and say, and then, you know, as a final offer, we're doing a, two, a three for one offer this month. If you pay us more money, we won't release the data that we've unlocked to the dark web. Exactly. You know, it, it just keeps going. Wow, that's I mean that's terrifying, isn't it? It's a really it's a really horrible situation where you you've you've done what you thought is right to get your your infrastructure, your business back online quicker and then you're just further yeah. exploited. And again, keep bringing it back to that human yeah. element. It's about putting the pressure on people and, and exposing people and yeah. supporting and, them. And, and and now I'm just thinking, oh my goodness me, you know, that data, if it's important, you know, it's it's almost it's very, very likely to be sensitive, yeah? Mm-hmm. And it could be sort of in the GDPR uh, space. Yeah. So there is an obligation, isn't there, to report a breach? Yeah, so you have um, 48 hours to... Well, you have 48 hours yeah. to report it from the moment you can confirm it's a breach. And this is the interesting piece, so businesses will dig their heels in for as long as possible before yeah. confirming it's a breach, because that's what starts the clock ticking. Yeah, no, I understand, but you could, you know, this is where all the different factors are starting to become. This is quite a pressure situation, especially if you've just got off the phone to the the folks that are telling you, you know, Mr. Smith, you know, this is this is what you have to do, and then you know you've got the the, the like you say when the official forty eight hours starts ticking. Um, yeah, this is really, this is a really tough. This is a very very extraordinarily tough scenario, isn't it? And you've also got to think about. At what point do these things 
cross into your mind. So again, if you're unprepared for this, and as you said before, if you're running off adrenaline, you get tunnel vision, are you focused on just getting your critical systems up so your business can run? Are you thinking about where this data is, what this data contains, you know, who's at jeopardy of this data getting getting leaked, which yeah. stakeholders would be affected? Who like are you thinking that's going yeah. away or is that coming later down the line and again yeah. less time to deal you with? You just it? made me th- you made me think something, so Rob, so you know I'm doing quite a few episodes over the next two weeks, which is great. I've got you know, a lot of uh, content being added uh, to the channel, really exciting stuff. And this morning, uh, I was speaking to a business coach. Um, she's got many years' experience as a police inspector. Okay. Um, you know, because I was talking about, you know, working under pressure and, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's CIOs go on about, you know, the operational pressure and stuff like that. But actually, you know, it's pretty serious, isn't it, if you're – uh, a police inspector, the sort of things you've dealt with. And we were talking about how, uh, um, you know, when you have to do something without thinking and do it well, you know, that's where you rehearse, that's where you have command and control. And this is sort of interesting, your point about, you know, the adrenaline, the, you know, the, the, the adrenaline um, blinkers are on. And if you haven't rehearsed and you don't say, right, it's a ransomware, we're now going into operation whatever, you know, your pre-rehearsed thing, that's where you can make these terrible judgments that seem absolutely the right thing at the time, but then they play out in a in a, a really horrible way that you just couldn't you you couldn't have fathomed. You need to do that scenario planning before it happens, not not as it's happening. It, it's spot on, John. Yeah, you need to you need to have in your mind your recovery strategy, your remediation strategy. You need to know every department's going to be involved in that, every person that's going to be a part of that, and you need to make sure that whoever's leading that. As I say, it probably will fall on a CIO and CTO role, but you can command the the playbook that brings everyone in at the right time, make sure people are, are working together at the right place, sharing the right information in order to reach, hopefully, a successful recovery. But without yeah. that planning, odds are there's going to be hiccups, there's going to be crossovers, there's going to be miscommunication, there's going to be issues. It's, yeah. it's a hornet's nest, yeah. essentially. It is. It, it, it is. And actually, you know, um, so I, I, I'm going to say fortunately, but fortunately, uh, the, the major incidents that I've been involved with in my career have been uh, in relation to um, uh, technology uh, issues mm-hmm. and um, some really, really big impacting outages from some very, very small, tiny esoteric engineering problems like the size of, of network packets. Mm-hmm being misconfigured between two devices that you get to at the end of a week of, you know, asking everyone, getting everyone involved, no one can fix it. So, that, you know, that, those sorts of things. Um, so, uh, you know, we're used, to, we're used to going in at that sort of level. But here, this feels like, you know, you, 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 lose a, you could lose a bit of hope because it's not, it's not necessarily an engineering solution that's going to get you out of this. This is this is you're starting to get into the realms of kind of game theory and negotiation and how you you know deal with the folks and damage limitation you know there's all sorts of it, um, yeah I don't want to keep going on about it but it, I think it is just I don't think um, folks that are listening can underestimate the impact this could have on on them. It's it's easy to write it off as. It's a, you know, I think, don't think anyone doesn't see it as a serious matter, but it's easy to write off and go, right, files yeah. are inaccessible. Yeah. We need to get them back up as, as good as possible. But it, it's not that. It's, it's the process. It's the people. It's the things involved. So even to the extent, like, and, it, if you think about it, if, you're, if your VoIP system goes down, if your UC tools go down, if your SAS apps go down, like, actually, we're talking about having to communicate with all these people. Well, yeah. what if you How can't you communicate? Them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember um, during... Um, you know, pre, just just as a pandemic broke, you know, mm-hmm. this story has been told by many, by everyone. Yeah, so I'm not saying this is in any way unique, but everyone basically had to figure out how to work remotely. Yeah. Um, and so we basically, all of us, had pulled off, you know, the biggest UK PLC business continuity plan ever done because the you know UK PLC carried on uh, a whole load of countermeasures, inc- including government support, furlough, remote working, you know, we, that's what we did. You know, we should, we'd all be really, uh, proud of, proud of that. Um, but what I started to do is I started to think, oh, um, in my business continuity thinking, I was only thinking of, you know, we lose access to the office. So what do we do next? 
now we're in a completely new setting. What's the continuity? You know, what's going to go wrong in this scenario? And uh, it's pretty scary to think that uh, you lose your, your 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 ability. Voice over IP is what you're referring to, but basically, you know, telephone, video, that sort of thing, your mm -hmm. private circuits. If they become compromised and suddenly uh, I've now got to pick up the phone to speak to my team, you know, you have to have those sorts of backup plans. Yeah, you're having, um, you're having major instant calls over FaceTime. It's crazy. Yeah. Like it's not... And yeah, or WhatsApp. Yeah. yeah, I've had a lot. I've had a few of those. Uh, or, or actually, in these sort of work anywhere times, you might need to actually declare a physical place where you all kind of congregate mm -hmm. and rally to, uh, if you had to. I don't know if it still happens, but there used to be a, c a company called SunGuard. They might have been bought or different um, different environment. What they used to do is they used to sell you a bus. You were aware of this, Rob? Yeah, so you, you you could literally spin up an office. You know the you, bus in, in like hours. Yeah, yeah, and you could rent it. It was such a clever business model because they obviously worked out almost like an insurance policy how many buses they they would need for how many customers. But the deal was, you know, if you couldn't access your office, you could get in a bus. This isn't about losing an office, is it? Or this is just losing it. It just it just ceased to be digital. It's just it's losing functionality, right? It's, it's yeah, losing yeah, the ability to work and. Yeah, I think it's it's noticing that blast radius as well is it's such a huge thing because uh, as I say, when it gets alerted, you'll probably be spotting a few key elements, and then suddenly this blast radius will just grow and yeah, grow and yeah. grow as you investigate, and more and more things get brought to your attention. Just the scale of it, you know, we've been talking about major incidents. Uh, there's a lot of different roles involved. You've got a CISO, you've got a CIO, you've got a board that you're reporting to. These are all massive company structures, and you know, there is a very significant portion of business in the UK that does go through the you know the top 250 but there is a huge tail of really important businesses in the UK that are the small to medium size are, are those guys um being saved because of the because they haven't got the scale to pay or is this technology going to get weaponized or not weaponized the wrong word industrialized so actually these smaller companies are going to get hit on a, do, do you see any of that happening between scale? You know, uh, yeah. so the smaller company that's got, you know, it's got some cash in its current account. You know, it's it's got money, um, but it hasn't got. It's not the same as the, you know, the, the bigger yeah. targets. I'm just wondering if we, if we see anything like that. No, so it, it's all relative, right? So I don't think there's any. There's no business that's immune because if you've got something that's valuable, that's more valuable than whatever ransom is asked for then there is root for extortion there. Um, you know, what what you'll see is just a difference in amounts that are asked for. Um, probably not even if you can see the of the tax. Again, it all comes down to, you know, you have to treat ransomware gangs as effective businesses and they'll yeah. have a business model and they'll know who their target market is and the target market yeah. is anyone who will pay. So where the SMB yeah. fall into Well, it, anyone who will pay who doesn't, who doesn't have MFA, multifactor authentication for me would be on my list of if I had a long list of targets, yeah, that would be one of the things I would sort my long list into a short list would be MFA. I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not saying, Rob, and I think it's really cool that you guys are very, very, uh, you're very careful to say don't rely on one piece. You know, don't think because you've got MFA, you're cool, or you've got this, everything. So you've got to have a, there's a surroundings. But I do think um, multi-factor authentication, um, by having it, it's a little bit like that terrible expression, you know, when you're being chased by a lion and you're in a group. As long as you're not the slowest person running, you're 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 you're, you're the safest. You know, I, it, that's an awful analogy, but there is a there's there are some things that small companies could do because MFA is not expensive, oh, especially no, for a small company. It's actually really straightforward to implement. But I'm amazed at how many folks still have, you know, they don't expire their passwords. Mm -hmm. you know things get sent on email when you get an account set up uh you know and it's just you just think oh my goodness me it's the, the, maybe they just haven't experienced it or well the, the crazy they haven't quite thing, got the head around it the crazy thing i think is you say that there's so many businesses who don't deploy these really simple mitigations but actually their users and their employees are used to doing this in their personal life like yes most most like domestic applications are now using MFA to an extent or yeah. you know, require stronger passwords or educating you in terms of how to, how to secure your accounts. But well, that, actually, Rob, so, um, you know, this is uh, for folks who may or may not know this, but you can, on Amazon, you can buy a firewall appliance. You know, it's an actual 
box. I don't know if it's a Raspberry Pi underneath mm. it all, but it's a it's a, an actual firewall dedicated appliance with four ports. And um, I won't say the company name, but there's a very very uh, 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 large security company that that does a lot of firewall technology, and you can install one of their commercial grade firewalls on your uh, uh, firewall at home for free because they they make it free for domestic use which is probably quite clever because I suppose they're thinking these technical folks, this might be a way of influencing a purchase. Yeah. Or, but, but I don't want to be too cynical. It might be a bit like some of the car manufacturers that share uh, safety technology amongst other car. You know, mm-hmm. they, they share their, their safety innovations because it's, it's good for everyone. Um, so, so you've got that. Um, uh, and then you've got maybe a VPN, so you're encrypted. And then maybe you've got multi-factor authentication on you know app, it, apple's got a very a good setup google's got a very good setup i think microsoft's it, it's it's definitely usable it's not quite as slick but you know it's available for everyone isn't it and and a lot of people like you say they do it at home and then at work it's not there w- why is that is that is that because there's some do, do we get kind of caught with trying to implement the big perfect is it perfection is the enemy of progress or is it you know what what's holding back that kind of look forget everything guys let's just put in mfa and patch everything and then let's talk about our more sophisticated approach to security i I think to be honest it just comes down to education understanding and exposure right i think the examples we use where companies aren't using mfa or encryption or these these kind of things or vpns they're not the companies who are then having long discussions about their security strategy, are they? They're, they're companies that see IT as a cost center rather than, you know, a business driver or something disruptive. And, and yeah. there's, there's still businesses out there where actually IT probably is just a cost center and it's not integral. But again, yeah. it's about weighing up. It's all about weighing up risk versus investment, isn't it? Um, yeah. I think, as I said at the start, with, with more and more companies, you know, investing in IT and using, using data to drive them and stuff, it's... It, we're moving away from that area but yeah it, it purely comes down to an understanding of the of the threat and, and what's out there yeah. um and i think that goes for, so, for all security doesn't it whether that's business or yeah. domestic or personal or anything it's all about understanding what what is the threat to me and absolutely. how much do i value the threat yeah. itself yeah yeah absolutely so um where where are we in our event uh, I, I definitely want to go down this immutable uh backup piece because i've i've definitely fallen foul of 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 believing that's kind of like my you know superpower uh or one of the superpowers um and then uh, and actually i've got a build on on you know uh, some of the stuff you were saying i wanted to mm-hmm. to throw something in on 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 storage uh in in a minute but are we ready to go down that route yeah to talk I think about so. storage so I, with, without breaking the the theater of the mind that we've been we've been painting yes i think we've had a few a few uh gone down a few different avenues here but um yes. let's say we know it, we know we're dealing with ransom normally you know the, the first thing you're going to need to do as I sort of touched on before is you're going to have to investigate the the blast radius of this attack you're going to need to know where that breach got in you're going to need to know what's been infected can you quarantine them can you isolate it um that's when you start doing your calculations of what this financial downtime is that we've we've touched a lot on you're going to start looking at, can we contain this? Is there going to be any media leaks? All, all this stuff's going on in these incident calls. Now that we know just how bad a ransom attack can be, our next video will cover what you can do to prevent these attacks. Learn about these important countermeasures and subscribe to the channel now to get access to a catalog of business technology topics that are easy to digest and share. Click the icon of John's face, such a handsome fellow. Honestly, some of the things they programmed me to say.